long presentation and uh, a lot of it's going to start with geology. So hopefully, um, you know, I don't lose uh, half of you, but if so, so be it. Um, I did give um, a version of this presentation last year at the Hard Rock Summit, uh, which is right around the corner in, in Denver. Uh, here's a shameless plug, uh, but I will be uh, dealing there. Uh, I also own Saga Minerals. I specialize in Midwest minerals. Um, obviously, uh, Illinois fluorite is one of the, the key focuses of my business. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, the Illinois Kentucky Flores Bar District and We'll go through the geology, uh, history, and critical mineral significance. All right, so uh, being a, a state geologist uh, for Illinois, first of all, let me just say that I did not work in the mines. Uh, I was not a geologist for Ozark Mahoning. Um, you know, all of, the, all of the knowledge that I have uh, basically comes from my interest in the Flores Bar District over the last two decades. And um, being a geologist uh, for the State Geological Survey also helps. Uh, but recently, there's a lot of interest uh, specifically in the Illinois Kentucky Flores Bar District, um, specifically for critical minerals. So first, let's uh, talk about the geology and the regional geology. Um, so the Illinois Kentucky Flores Bar District is in the southeast corner of Illinois. And what this uh, map of the US is showing is basically the outline of the Illinois Basin. The Illinois Basin is an intercrotonic basin. Uh, it is filled with uh, Phanerozoic sediments. Uh, so pretty much all Paleozoic sediments. Uh, so thousands of feet of sedimentary rock on top of the Precambrian basement. Um, in the Illinois Basin, it'd actually be on the uh, southwest side. Uh, but something of note, uh, can you all see my uh, cursor? Yes, we can. OK, um, so something of note that I wanted to point out, I don't have marked on this map, but the Illinois Kentucky Flores Bar District is surrounded by other Mississippi Valley type deposits. Um, let's see here. OK. Uh, if you don't know what a Mississippi Valley type deposit is, I'm giving you a little bit of homework. Uh, I'll give you a very basic definition of it. Uh, it mainly consists of lead and zinc minerals. Uh, it's mostly hosted in limestone and or dolomite. Uh, and it's commonly on the flanks of sedimentary basins. Um, they're epigenetic. Basically, they were deposited uh, post-rock lithification, and they're strata-bound. And they're typically related to low-temperature hydrothermal brines derived from evaporated seawater. That's the very basic definition. I want to point out some of those Mississippi Valley type deposits. Uh, we have the type locality for MVTs uh, up around Galena, um, Galena, Illinois. Uh, some of you might know Shoalsburg, Wisconsin. Obviously, a lot of great specimens came out of those mines. Um, Tri-state district uh, within uh, Oklahoma and Kansas and Joplin, Missouri. Uh, the uh, Missouri Lead Belt, uh, probably a lot of you know the Sweetwater Mine, uh, and then down here, uh, Central Tennessee Zinc District, uh, obviously, probably a bunch of you know the Elmwood Mine, uh, and then of course, um, well, maybe not of course, uh, people are not familiar with the uh, zinc deposits up in Central Kentucky. So all around the Illinois Basin, we have these MVT deposits. Um, and why those are important, I'll get to uh, the connection between Mississippi Valley type deposits and the Illinois Kentucky Flores Bar District. I want to point out a couple major related uh, regional structures to the, the Flores Bar District. Uh, first of all, we have this rift that's coming through. It's a, it's a failed rift uh, or a lockagen. This is called the real foot rift. And it takes a right turn right up where the Flores Bar District is uh, and turns into the Rough Creek Graben, which is filled with tens of thousands of feet of uh, sedimentary rock. Um, moving up north, uh, you almost have a triple junction right here if any of you follow uh, geophysics and plate tectonics. Uh, but moving up north, we have a continuation of the real foot rift into the Wabash Valley fault zone that kind of borders uh, Illinois and Indiana. And this actually uh, moves up into central Illinois in what I recently defined as the Illinois lockagen. I, I have a, a paper coming out uh, maybe in a couple of weeks in the sedimentary record about that. Um, the rifting is, this is early Cambrian rifting, uh, really late protozoic to early Cambrian rifting. This is related to the breakup of Rodinia. Um, other things I wanna point out that are important to the deposits, 
uh, is this fold and fault belt, this uh, Wachita orog uh, orogeny uh, related to the Wachita Mountains and then the Appalachian orogeny. Um, uh, of course, the Appalachian Mountains over here, and these are related to uh, Pangaea Formation and breakup. Uh, and lastly, uh, the Mississippi Embayment. It really stands out. The Mississippi River borders Western Illinois and comes down here and follows the Rio Foot Rift. All right, so uh, that was a good five minutes just on the first slide. So I, I promise I won't take as long in the slides to come. Um, so now uh, after that, let's uh, just walk through what I'm gonna be talking about in this presentation. So first of all, so I don't have to keep saying the Illinois Kentucky Flores Bar District, I'm gonna refer to it as the IKFD. Um, and uh, no shade to the uh, Kentucky folks. I saw one of my Kentucky Geological Survey uh, colleagues on here, but I'm gonna largely be focusing on the Illinois side. This is where all the modern mines were. Um, so the IKFD is divided by the Ohio River, which I have marked out in red here. And obviously on the Western side is the Illinois side and the Eastern side, the Kentucky side. So we're just gonna focus on Illinois. Um, we will walk through the geology, uh, oh, sorry, uh, critical minerals. So uh, I added this to the talk uh, kind of at the last minute because I thought, um, you know, critical minerals, hopefully most of you have heard about critical minerals. If you haven't, don't worry, I will give you a brief intro and why they're important at the IKFD. Then we'll get into the geology. And I wanna talk about a feature called Pick Stone for a little bit. Uh, this is, uh, has major critical mineral significance and uh, many of you probably have not heard of Hickstone within the IKFD. Uh, and then we'll transition over to the IKFD. I'll go through a brief history um, and then uh, we'll get to the fluorite. Uh, I'll briefly talk about the parigenesis and the importance with specimens. And then lastly, we'll finally get to the bling and look at pictures. And uh, like I said, it's a long presentation. So if you don't wanna keep looking at pretty pictures of uh, fluorite, you can bow out. All right, so uh, critical minerals. Uh, minerals are deemed critical or strategic because they are essential to the economic and national security of the United States. Uh, and really because the United States is around 90% dependent on these imports, uh, largely from major adversaries such as China. So they are absolutely at risk of uh, supply chain disruption. And a lot of you have heard about supply chain disruption over the last two years uh, during the COVID period. It's a real thing and it really stems uh, from the raw materials. The importance of critical minerals really cannot be understated. It's got hundreds, if not thousands of end users and applications in clean energy production, uh, the other end of the spectrum, oil refining, electronics, uh, batteries for electric vehicles, phosphors uh, for lighting, the screens that we're staring at right now, uh, defense technologies, and really some of the major criticals are rare earths, um, which we'll talk about. Uh, and these are so important for the stability and growth of our modern society. All right, so as of 2022, um, Department of Interior has now grown the list of critical minerals to 50 critical minerals. So they're all uh, highlighted here. And I'm gonna highlight uh, ones in red that are significant at the IKFD. Um, so many of you might look at this and say, oh, wow, uh, there's a lot. Uh, fluorine is obviously, it's a no brainer. We have fluoride at the Illinois Kentucky Flores Bar District. Uh, zinc with our sphalerite, uh, barium with our barite there. All of you are familiar with those specimens. Uh, but beryllium, yttrium, niobium, titanium, and all of these rares. Uh, so we're going to talk about those. Uh, those are largely focused at Hickstone. So we're going to get into the geology of Hickstone. Okay, first of all, uh, here's a, a newish map. This was done by one of my colleagues, Brett Denny, who recently retired. Um, there are 12 sub-districts uh, and there are many, many mines around these uh, sub-districts and within these sub-districts. Uh, something that I wanna point out is that 11 of these sub-districts surround Hickstone. So you can kind of see this uh, aerial figure around Hickstone. Uh, so we'll first talk about Hickstone. 
And then later in the talk, when we're looking at the specimens, uh, it's mostly going to focus on Harris Creek and the Cave and Rock subdistricts. And that's because this is where all the uh, modern mines were. Now, likely some of our specimens that we see out there today came from these other subdistricts. Uh, many of you have seen uh, Gaskins mine, fluorites, and calcites. Uh, but a lot of these other subdistricts just aren't represented, and it's likely because people mislabeled specimens. It just wasn't important back in the day to label where the specimens were coming from. Okay, so let's get into Hicks Dome. Uh, we've actually recently started calling uh, Hicks Dome and other features uh, within the IKFD its own separate province because we think it's different enough and significant enough. Uh, so we're calling it the Permian Wabukiku Igneous Province, or PWIP. Um, and we might actually take out that Permian. Uh, we just got back some recent data. Uh, actually, the USGS shared with us uh, finding that some of the mineralization in Hicks Dome goes all the way to early Cretaceous. So that's kind of interesting. All right, so let's talk about some of the work uh, that's been done as part of the USGS Earth MRI program. So maybe in past uh, talks, you've heard about the Earth MRI program. It's a critical mineral mapping initiative across the entire United States. Uh, it started four or five years ago, uh, specifically targeting critical minerals. And as part of it, um, they are spending money uh, doing new high resolution uh, aeromagnetic geophysical surveys. And that's what you're looking at right now. So this is uh, three surveys that were done over the past uh, five years, stitched together, and it makes for a, a pretty amazing image. Uh, I would encourage any of you that are interested in that, all of the raw data is available to the public. Um, you might want to jot this down or somebody put it in the, the comments. Um, I can certainly send it to you folks later. Uh, even if you just search uh, USGS Earth MRI, AeroMag, uh, you can find this data. Uh, these are magnetic surveys. It's basically a geophysical technique that measures variations in the magnetic field. Uh, to de determine basically the location of subsurface features. Um, so as I mentioned, in the med Midwest or within the sedimentary basin that we're looking at, uh, there is a very thick sedimentary cover. So, you know, as a geologist, I would love to go drill holes everywhere and, and acquire core, but this is just not economic. So we need to use techniques such as AeroMag uh, to understand what's going on in the deep Precambrian basement rocks. Um, now, uh, I'll talk about a couple features here. I just want to point out over here in the lead belt, you can see it's just fantastic. There's a lot going on, and I would highly recommend uh, you look up some of Ann, Cafferty's, Ann McCafferty's work. Uh, she's at the USGS. She led all of these surveys, and she's got a great paper out on interpretation uh, of mineral deposits within the Missouri lead belt. Uh, and some of the IOA deposits there. Uh, something else I want to point out here is the South Central Magnetic Lineament. Uh, this is very interesting to us. It's very interesting to the USGS. Uh, it's recently been interpreted as a deep proterozoic terrain boundary uh, and thought to be conducive for magmatic intrusions and directing deep metalliferous fluids. So obviously for exploring for new critical mineral deposits, features like this are very important to us. So let's get over to the Hicks Dome survey and we're gonna zoom in here on some important features that we found. Okay, so what you can see is these linear features that are interpreted as intrusives. And we know that these are intrusives because many of them outcrop at the surface, uh, but, there are many that don't outcrop at the surface. So this survey discovered many new intrusives that we didn't know about, as well as igneous bodies. So these igneous bodies are very uh, interesting to us. Uh, you can see that they're uh, penetrated by the intrusives. Um, now, what these igneous bodies are, we're not really sure yet. Uh, we are working on them. But something I want to point out is, is Hicks Dome. And you'll notice that Hicks Dome uh, does not give off a magnetic signature. And this is likely due to different types of uh, magma uh, that, is, that is forming these bodies. Uh, we know uh, from drill core information that Hicks Dome is comprised of uh, ultramafic rocks uh, or alkaline dikes, largely classified as alnolites. These are uh, melolite and phlogopite 
uh, olivine rich rocks, uh, but also of even greater significance is uh, deep carbonatite. Okay, and carbonatites are basically carbonate rich uh, magmatic rocks and often associated with rare earth elements, and they're, they're pretty rare on planet Earth. Um, so these are very, very important to us. But what this says is that there might be more Hicks dome uh, features out there that we don't know about uh, that are related to some of these intrusives. One thing you'll notice on, on here is that there is multiple sets of intrusives. So you have, uh, this kind of got cut off up here, but there are prominent sets of uh, north to south trending intrusives, but then there's also a prominent set, a very prominent set of uh, uh, northwest southeast trending intrusives. And, and basically what that tells us is that uh, there are multiple periods uh, of uh, magmatic intrusion and that the tectonics here is very complicated, uh, hopefully as you gathered from that first geologic map that I showed. Um, so that is something that we need to work on is unraveling the tectonic history in this area. Okay, so let's get into Hicks Dome. Uh, Hicks Dome is in both Hardin County and crosses over into Polk County. Uh, it's a feature that is both topographic um, and a structural dome that forms a bullseye pattern, as you can see on this geologic map. Uh, the dome is about 10 miles in diameter. And the rocks at its apex, uh, apex are uplifted uh, 4,000 feet above uh, structural relief. Um, these are mid Middle Devonian rocks uh, in the center of the dome. And as you move out, you move uh, concentrically out uh, through geologic time to uh, Pennsylvania rocks out on the, the edge. Now, faults surround the dome concentrically, uh, but also with those northeast uh, or northwest, uh, southeast trending uh, dikes that we see. Uh, there's also a prominent set of uh, northeast southwest uh, trending fractures that move through it too, that are very important to some of the floor spar deposits. Um, the dome is interpreted as a product of one or more underground explosive events uh, via magmatic intrusions, and they've previously uh, been defined as crypto explosive or crypto volcanic features. So pretty cool sounding uh, stuff. So what do we see at, at Hicks Dome? Uh, so let's move into Hicks Dome. These are some of the drill cores uh, that have been taken uh, by Hicks Dome LLC, the, the current company that owns the dome. Uh, these are mostly dated as Permian rocks, uh, and they consist of carbonites, uh, carbonatites, lamperfiers, and mineralized breccias. So uh, these two boxes are showing mineralized breccias. Uh, you can see this one is at about 500 feet. These are about at about uh, 2,000 feet. Um, they're very, very complex, and they're very different from textures that you see at other sub-districts that surround the dome. So your typical uh, IKFD deposits are these uh, strata-bound uh, bedding replacement fluorites. This is a typical fluorite that you might see around Hasty Quarry, one of the uh, aggregate uh, operations uh, within the Cave and Rock District. Uh, so let's look at some of these breccias because these are very, very significant uh, when it comes to crystal minerals. Uh, so here's a thin section scan of that breccia. And um, uh, one thing that you'll notice is uh, the complexity of this thing. Uh, it's got abundant country rock class. So these are uh, all Paleozoic class uh, composed of all of the, the uh, uh, stratigraphy through Hex Dome. Uh, from Devonian to Pennsylvania rocks, actually all the way down to the Ordovician rocks, and they're cross-cut with veins, and these veins are, are, are pretty typical of MVT minerals, uh, typically calcites, barites, quartz, uh, fluorite, uh, but it's the, it's the breccia that we're interested in. Let's look a little closer, and you'll notice that a lot of these class have been replaced by fluorite. Uh, so that's pretty interesting. These are probably limestone class that have been replaced. Uh, replacement of limestone is very typical throughout the IKFD. Uh, but looking at this fine grain matrix, uh, some Hickstone LLC has referred to this as a rock flower. Uh, this is where all the rare earth elements are tied up. So a little closer look. This particular sample has a very high concentration of flora apatite. 
uh, in this one thin section photomicrograph alone, I can pick out almost 50 flora haptites. Uh, but this particular sample uh, has uh, over 20,000 uh, total rare earth elements, 20,000 ppm that is, uh, total rare earth elements within this one sample. So it's significant. We need other techniques, higher resolution techniques to, uh, to see some of the other minerals that, were, that are in this uh, largely dolomitic matrix. So minerals that we see at Hicks Dome uh, are pretty varied. So besides your typical MVT minerals, uh, the lead and zinc minerals, uh, fluorite, barite, uh, celestites, there's a lot of other exotic minerals that we find. Uh, I mentioned titanium earlier. It's very rich in uh, rutile, anatase, brookite. Um, all of them are niobium bearing. Um, and then other exotic minerals such as pyrochlor, which is a major site for rare earth elements. Uh, Hickstone has a very significant thorium signature uh, tied up in brevantite and sherylite. Uh, Brithylite, another uh, rare earth element uh, site. Xenotimes common, monazite, uh, bertrandite, uh, that gives off our beryllium signature, very, very common. Uh, in some areas, there's a multiple percent of beryllium. Uh, and then other rare bearing minerals, parasite, florencite, bastonite. So uh, I have no doubt as we continue our research of Hickstone that we'll probably find um, some new minerals. I don't mean new minerals within mineralogy, some minerals that have yet to be documented there. Uh, so the Hickstone uh, rare earth ge geochemistry is, is really pretty phenomenal. Uh, this is new data from our Earth MRI project down there. Uh, me and my colleague Yar Trela have been collecting samples and sending them off uh, through that program and getting back some wonderful results. Uh, what this shows is that the carbonatite at Hicks Dome is very, very rich in light rare earth elements. Uh, but Hicks Dome contains both light rare earth element and rich carbonatite but then also of even more significance uh, is the heavy rare earth uh, enriched breaches. Um, Lamperfears can contain both uh, throughout. So right now we're trying to, to group these, uh, these different uh, 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 igneous uh, facies and, and determine you know, which ones are going to be uh, more significant for unraveling and understanding the, the deposit and the critical minerals uh, significance. So the breaches are rich in rare earth elements, but also uh, really Hickstone Corporation looks at it as a fluorite deposit. There's a metallurgical problem there. Uh, we actually have uh, one of my metallurgists for another project that I'm working on is working on trying to separate out the rares from the fluorite to make a high grade acid spar fluorite. Uh, but there's, uh, I believe, currently a estimation of uh, over 60 million tons of, of fluoride alone within the deposit. Uh, the breccia at Hickstone, we believe is just the tip of the iceberg. We think that there's a deeper seated carbonatite that has not been penetrated at Hickstone. Uh, but the results that we're seeing right now uh, really mimic some other major economic rare earth carbonatite deposits around the world, uh, such as Bear Lodge in Wyoming or Loftal, Namibia. Uh, really, there's a, a pretty long list of other rare earth deposits uh, that are similar to Hickstone. Okay, so let's get into the system and deposit type. And I had some more modern models, but I, I really love this model. And I think it still stands true. Um, not only is it kind of funny, but uh, the geology is good in it. Um, I've heard um, online and proposed before that Hickstone uh, is a meteorite impact. Uh, hopefully everything that I've showed you so far has, has told you it's definitely not a meteorite impact. Uh, we have magmatic rocks uh, coming into Hickstone that are not related to a meteorite impact. Uh, the interesting thing is the relationship with uh, a basin brine or Mississippi Valley type deposit. So what is the relationship with the MVT deposit um, and the magmatic rares that we see? And right now the USGS is kind of classifying this as a hybrid deposit. So basically we have northward migrating upper crustal saline brine mixing with magmatic uh, injection of mantle-derived volatiles 
or here, um, the devil's uh, magmatic gases. Um, and these volatiles uh, and this, this introduction of magma is heating, but also acidifying uh, by venting um, HF, uh, HCl, sulfur dioxide, carbon dioxide, causing dissolution, caving, and collapse. So uh, that explains the collapse brushes. Uh, but also the significance of the fluorine. Where is the fluorine coming? So is this the, is the the magmatic rocks the source of uh, the fluorine uh, that's related to the IKFD? That's something that we're still trying to determine, and uh, we're we're currently uh, talking about a NSF proposal uh, to target just that. Okay, so. Uh, now I'm going to kind of transition into IKFD, uh, if everybody's still with me. Um, and let's talk about the time of deposition. So I, I kind of talked through around uh, Permian, but I also mentioned up to early Cretaceous based on some new data that we have. Uh, I want to point out that mineralization in the upper Mississippi Valley uh, is dated at 270 million years, roughly around 270 million years. That's Permian. Uh, the IKFD, almost everything that has been dated has dated uh, around 270 as well. So the relationship of these two mineral deposits has been speculated for some time. Um, and, you know, one thing that we can say is uh, the mineral deposits are contemporaneous with the igneous activity uh, within the real foot rift. Okay, we know that from dating all of the intrusives and the dates within Hickstone. Um, so is there a relationship with the mineral deposits in the Mississippi Valley type deposits in the upper Mississippi Valley? Most likely. And uh, there likely is a correlation uh, to the uplift, uh, the Permian uplift along the Awatch to Fold Belt uh, that produced topographic relief uh, that drove the saline brines that are interacting with our magmatic rocks uh, up through conduits such as the real foot rift and up into the Illinois basin, perhaps picking up uh, metals on its way and depositing out the upper Mississippi Valley uh, lead zinc minerals that we see uh, today. Okay, so I'm, I'm obviously just, um, there's a lot, I mean, I could spend the whole talk on the origin of this stuff, but there's, there's still a lot to go over. Um, so, Again, now transitioned into the Illinois Kentucky Flores Bar District. At the IKFD, these are strata bound deposits. Uh, the mineralization occurs in sedimentary rocks of Paleozoic age. Uh, these strata bound deposits are primarily hosted in Mississippi and carbonates. That's around 342 million years old. Um, now, something interesting for people who collect the Illinois Kentucky Flores Bar District you'll often see uh, labels, especially Ross Lilly labels. Uh, Ross, if you don't know who he is, I'm sure most of you do, but he was a, a geologist uh, that worked for Ozark Mahoney at the IKFD, he assembled uh, arguably the world's best collection of Illinois flora. And Ross was really great about writing locations, writing information uh, on the back of his labels. Um, and that information uh, included uh, information such as the level that that specimen came from, such as Bethel level or Rosa Claire level. Now, when he refers to the level, uh, basically the levels were named after the strata that formed the roof of the mineralized level. So for example, the Bethel level means that the Bethel was the roof uh, of the fluorite deposit. So the fluorite was actually coming from the Downey's Bluff or in the sake of the Rosa Claire level, uh, the fluorite would have been coming from uh, St. Genevieve or uh, Spar Mountain. Okay, so there are multiple types of uh, deposits uh, within the IKFD, uh, four to be exact, or that have been documented at least. There is a uh, bedding replacement, uh, over on this diagram shows the bedding replacement, which I'll talk about in just a second. And then there is the vein type fluorite, um, which is more typical of the Kentucky side, but also is very prominent on the Illinois side as well. Um, now the strata bound deposits are often capped by impermeable strata. 
So this might be a shale, in this case, the Bethel sandstone, which is a very tight sandstone, very well cemented. And what's happening is fluids are moving up conduits, uh, in this case, uh, faults uh, or fractures. As we know, it's a very tectonically active area and tectonically complex. And the fluids are hitting this impermeable baffle. Uh, and then uh, these fluids that are acidic and uh, enriched in, in fluorine uh, are replacing the calcium carbonate. So perhaps the, the calcium uh, is... Uh, helping form the, the fluorite and the, the CAF2 that we see today. Um, generally, um, the beds can stretch for miles. Um, so that's pretty impressive. And you'll, you'll see that when you look at the maps uh, within the IKFD. Um, now the fluorite veins, uh, they're commonly three to 12 feet in width um, and they're mineralized along the strike of the fault. Uh, typically for several hundred feet, but veins have been found up to 45 feet wide. So that's that's pretty impressive. And in fact, there was an operation on the Kentucky side. I'm not sure if it's uh, still in operation. Uh, it was called the Klondike Number no. 2, uh, ran by uh, Hasty. And um, uh, I believe that, uh, that vein was around 25 to 30 feet thick that they were going after. Now, the third type of deposit that we see there is called a residual gravel spar. I don't have a diagram of that. Uh, for those of you that have seen recent specimens coming out around Hasty Quarry or Spar Mountain, this is uh, coming from areas of gravel spar. Okay, so this is actually sitting on top of the limestones, uh, and it's basically sitting on top of a weathered zone, and the gravel spar forms because of an unconformity. So what's happening is, is you're, there's missing time, you're getting strata that's being dissolved out, and the fluorite is dropping on top of the unconformity. So you have anomalous concentrations uh, of fluorite, but it's often highly, highly weathered. Um, once in a while, they'll, they'll hit some really unusually uh, cool uh, dissolved out specimens like the ones that some of us saw last year at Tucson, uh, but typically it's, it's pretty rough and tumble. Um, and then another thing to mention is fluorite breccia. You do have uh, collapsed breccias, obviously, with a lot of tectonics in this area, and then, of course, the, uh, the, the breccia that I showed in Hickstock. Okay, so bed forms and fluorite. Since you're replacing uh, the bedding, the sedimentary bedding, uh, seeing preserved sedimentary bed forms is very common. Uh, it's a wonderful place to take a field trip. Um, Hasty doesn't look too kindly on mineral collectors anymore, uh, but certainly academics, uh, they've always let academics come in and take field trips. And you'll see a lot of preserved uh, sedimentary features. In this case, uh, these are uh, desiccation or mud cracks. Uh, likely in a marl that, that uh, formed calcite within the mud cracks that were then replaced by fluorite. Uh, here we have uh, ripple marks. Uh, you can see fluorite forming uh, in the troughs of the ripples. So pretty fascinating stuff. Uh, I've seen lots of fossils that have been replaced by fluorite. I wish I had a picture um, of um, uh, corals that I've seen replaced by fluorite. Uh, but many times uh, looking at specimens, you'll see fossils uh, included in your specimens, uh, especially high magnesium, cal uh, high magnesium fossils. When you get the dissolution of the uh, calcium carbonate, those high magnesium fossils are typically dropping out uh, of the pocket and sometimes you'll find them in the matrix uh, uh, for, for matrix specimen fluorides. Um, so I talked about bedding replacement a little bit. Uh, one of the typical things that you see there is what uh, locals like to call the coontail. Um, and basically you're, you're just seeing uh, sedimentary beds here or, or lamina that have been replaced and preserved by fluoride. Um, so often these, these really make beautiful specimens, uh, especially for uh, those of us that are sedimentologists. Uh, they tell a pretty neat story. Uh, but pockets also form. So, you know, when you're hitting those impermeable beds, you will get dissolution probably of uh, uh, high calcium limes. Uh, uh, you'll get preferential dissolution of those high calcium limes and pockets forming. Um, so this is where a lot of the great specimens uh, that we see today came out of large caverns that formed. Okay, so let's get into the mining history now. Um, 
the uh, the Illinois Kentucky Floor Spar District actually started as a lead prospect back in the early 1800s. Now, Illinois was the uh, leading domestic producer of fluorite from 1942 uh, until the close of the mines in 1995. Uh, the two last mines in operation were Minerva and Annabelle Lee. Um, but you'll notice on this uh, chart here that a lot of the production obviously follows war. Uh, a lot of raw materials are needed when wars are happening uh, and we get a drop in depression. Um, and you'll notice uh, on this diagram that shows a uh, percentage of, of fluorite, uh, the, the grade of fluorite goes over 100%. That's likely due to bad data that was recorded in the 1930s but uh, the authors of this publication thought it was important to record that. Uh, but you can see right when Denton uh, mine comes online, you see a jump uh, in the quality of the, the fluoride. There's been a lot of players over time um, that have came in and mined fluoride. Uh, I've documented all of these that have came in and out uh, through multiple periods of time. The only uh, current uh, mining operation, which is really an aggregate operation, is Hasty Mining. Uh, so they're currently mining and they will fulfill fluoride orders. So they, uh, they do process fluoride on site, uh, especially when they get into a, a fluoride rich area. Uh, I was there with USGS a few years ago, and they just hit a significant vein, and uh, Don Hasty called it his million-dollar fluorite uh, vein, but, uh, you know, it was pure acid-grade fluorospar, not good specimens, but great for um, uh, fulfilling orders of acid-grade fluorospar. Uh, Ozark Mahoning uh, operated until the close in 1995, so that's... Uh, that's the company that um, that Ross Lilly worked for. Other geologists uh, worked for Penwalt that was uh, bought by Ozark Mahoney. Uh, something important to history, especially if you go down there and uh, take a trip uh, to Cave and Rock, you can almost always run into somebody uh, that knew someone or is related to someone uh, that perished in the Barnett uh, complex mine disaster. Um, so I think it's an important part of history. Uh, I'll talk about how they mine the floor spar in a little bit, which is pretty dangerous. And it's, it's pretty amazing that they didn't have more fatalities than they actually did. This was uh, the major uh, uh, fatality event that happened, uh, at least in the modern mines that was reported. Uh, so during drifting, uh, they drilled three uh, holes that struck a water course. So basically the, the level started to flood with water. Um, that happened um, uh, on April 9th, 1971. And so they, they left uh, the drift to allow pumps to drain the water. Um, when they came back in the next day on the first shift, uh, H2S, which is a uh, poisonous gas, gas was detected. Um, so they left uh, to have uh, to let ventilation uh, fans basically take out the, the gas. Uh, on the second shift, uh, when they came back in, uh, that ventilation fan had failed. Um, so they installed a replacement fan and, and thought everything was great. Um, and before that, that fan was even started up, uh, the, the guys who uh, installed went missing, okay? Um, and so the brother of uh, uh, one of the miners that was down there went in to, to look for that miner. He never returned. Uh, five guys went back in looking for, for <laughs> those two guys, and they never came out. So uh, in total, seven, uh, seven guys uh, perished. Um, and I talked to the, the lead mine engineer that was there, uh, and I mean, he just teared up when talking about it, you know, they just kept going in, even though he said, no, wait, wait for, uh, you know, the mine rescue guys to come and they, they wouldn't wait because it was their brother, you know, that was in there, uh, that they were rescuing. So, uh, pretty sad event. And they actually just erected a statue, uh, remembering, uh, the Barnett, uh, miners who perished in that disaster. Um, so something interesting, this is Hasty Quarry. Um, I was in here with USGS and John Rakavan, who many of you know. Um, and 
uh, when you're in Hasty Quarry, you can see some of the old uh, mine edits. So this is uh, from the old lead mine. Uh, this is in Cave and Rock subdistrict. Uh, sometimes you can even see uh, old rail cart tracks coming out of these mine edits. Um, now, some of these were edits, um, and uh, um, typically uh, for for the modern mines, they were shafts. Uh, so they would go down a, uh, a shaft uh, in a hoist, uh, but some of the mines did have portals. Okay, so uh, you would go down a decline in the portal. This is the Mahoney number uh, four portal uh, taken by the famous rock courier. Okay, so uh, mining methods. So uh, this is pretty complicated, and uh, if if you're interested in this, I would encourage you reading more about it because I'll probably butcher this. Uh, but the the type of mining was uh, called shrinkage stoping, and uh, shrinkage stoping is is typical in ore deposits with steeply dipping narrow ore bodies. So remember, most of the fluoride is forming uh, along these steeply different dipping fractures and faults. Uh, so it works out pretty well. Now, what's happening is uh, an open excavation is formed uh, by ore extraction uh, or stopes are created by, by caving the rock from above. Uh, so this is called overhead stoping. Uh, and then a stole is, is wedged in diagonal, diagonally uh, between the competent rock walls, okay? Um, and then poles are actually laid on top of that stole uh, and, and layered on top of it to, to support it as it was blasted above. Um, and there's openings within the stole where they put the ore cart and it's basically a gravity feed uh, where that ore comes down and fills up that, that ore cart. Um, there's upward lifts or raises uh, on about five foot centers. Um, <clears throat> that were driven upward to about 20 feet uh, within the mines, uh, leaving arches to support the broken ore as it's caved downward. Um, there are definitely more stable and safer methods of mining, um, uh, but because the ore took up about 50% uh, larger volume than the ore in place, uh, some of the blasted material had to be removed uh, to supply headroom for advancing raises. So, so this methodology worked pretty good. Um, I actually have a picture of this uh, from one of the older mines. Uh, I believe this is in the uh, 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 Fairview uh, complex. Um, so here's your, your stoles. And then, as I said, the, the, this is a gravity feed uh, into the ore carts. Uh, so pretty interesting. Okay, so uh, these are some pictures of the Annabelle Lee mine from Alan Goldstein, uh, who got to visit uh, back in the 90s. Uh, so modern techniques, they're using front end loaders uh, to, to pull out that, that ore that is then caved. Um, so, so they use the front end loader to, to pull it out. Um, and you can see uh, your, your ventilation uh, uh, pipes, your water pipes for pumping out the water. Water is a huge problem in the mines there. Obviously, you're right next to the Ohio River. So you're always having water that's seeping into the mine. So you constantly have to be pumping out water. Um, so here's a picture of uh, one of the pockets uh, that Alan got to visit. Um, within this pocket, there were single cubes up to 12 centimeters that were found here. Um, so you can see the miners examining these and uh, miners often pulled out uh, specimens within their lunch boxes. Uh, they were not allowed to, to pull out specimens. So typically large specimens from the district are, are pretty rare. Uh, most of the specimens that we see are, are large cabinet and smaller. Uh, now here's a picture of uh, famous Ross Lilly when he was geologist there for a few years. Uh, working in the mines. He's examining uh, one of those pockets. Um, and something to note here, which is interesting, is uh, there's that impermeable strata that I was talking about. So you can see uh, that the bed just below this impermeable strata, it's a, a shale layer. All of the, the ore is forming right below that. You don't have any ore above that. So that's pretty interesting. This photo is from 1986. Uh, collecting in a rather large pocket. This is the sub Rosa Claire level. Um, so in the St. Genevieve limestone within Annabelle Lee. Uh, this is an Eric Livingston uh, picture, again, inspecting uh, specimens. Look at the size of those fluorites here. Uh, unfortunately, there's just 
no modern pictures. Uh, you can only imagine uh, what some modern pictures of, of some of these caverns would look like. Uh, Eric Livingston, uh, he was a notable geologist there. He actually uh, worked there for 30 plus years. He was the senior geologist. Uh, he uh, was Ross Lilly's boss and he took care of all the closing of the mines and remediation and opened the, um, the uh, American Floors Farm Museum in Rosa Claire, uh, which he recently uh, retired from and, and handed it over to the town of Rosa Claire. Uh, something common uh, that is often talked about by locals and, and was talked about by miners uh, was pillar robbing. So pillar robbing uh, is exactly what it sounds like. So there would be pillars that they would have to leave up for stability. And some of those pillars would have uh, specimens in them. I hope some of you are chuckling that, that know these, uh, these suspects here. Uh, this is a, a young uh, Mark Cabasso uh, here from Open At It. Uh, who snuck in with Rock Courier into Mahoning number four uh, to see if they could recover some specimens. And of course, uh, many of you know this character. This is uh, a Stan Espen shade uh, from Midwest Minerals with a, a wonderful uh, mustache going on here. Uh, I've heard stories from the locals uh, that when they would find out that outsiders were sneaking in uh, to some of the mines, they would block them in and, and with, a, with a vehicle and wait there until they would come out. So uh, I've heard from these guys that they would have to hide <laughs> in the mines for uh, hours and hours until that vehicle would leave so they could sneak back out without getting arrested. Okay, so uh, let's look at the mineral paragenesis. Uh, I think this is very important. Uh, I am a sedimentary petrographer uh, by trade, so I, put together paragenetic sequences a lot. A paragenetic sequence is basically the sequential order of mineral deposition during the formation um, of the, the mineral deposit. But I also like to add other related diagenetic events to my uh, paragenetic sequence. Uh, so this one, I actually, I modified this uh, from an older publication and added some events that I know of just from handling so many specimens. Um, but I, what I didn't put on here is dissolution events, uh, which are very, very common, uh, obviously with multiple pulses of fluids coming in. Um, so uh, dissolution is common through the three main uh, fluid events, but you can see that there's this early uh, yellow fluorite, and often you'll see that that, that early yellow is dissolved out and then a later uh, fluidization event uh, brings in another uh, uh, metalliferous uh, fluid or fluorine rich fluid that deposits, deposits uh, later generations of fluoride. So uh, notably are the blues, um, certainly uh, blue fluorides are, are uh, people are always after those. I don't know if this is gonna work, but um, I can't see myself, but I'll, I'll show an example of this. Um, I don't know if you can see this, but so here's the dissolved out yellow, and then we have a blue cap uh, from a later fluid depositing on top of that dissolved out yellow. Um, also of note is all of the other minerals on here, all of the other gang minerals. Uh, so, you know, they were specifically after fluorite, sometimes after the zinc uh, or the lead, but what makes Illinois uh, so amazing, in my opinion, not only is the different uh, uh, color zoning, but also the association with all the different minerals. So we see calcopyrite inclusions. Uh, we see hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons are, are very relevant to everything that we see in our fluorite specimen, certainly related to the dissolution events um, that you see those, those yellow dissolved out fluorides often are related to uh, hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons sometimes coat uh, later generations of fluoride and preserve the luster on them so that fluoride doesn't get dissolved out. So hydrocarbons are very important. And what's happening is these hydrothermal fluids are coming up uh, through uh, organic rich shales uh, in our Illinois basin. It's the New Albany shale and cooking that organic rich shale and producing the hydrocarbons and, and bringing them up uh, into uh, the deposit. Uh, other notable minerals uh, is witherite. Obviously, I don't have all the other uh, 
rare barium minerals that exist in the district, um, benstonite, uh, alstonite, para-alstonite, strontianite's missing on here. Uh, but uh, in general, this is, I, I think this is a pretty good uh, working paragenetic sequence of uh, the IKFD. Uh, so one of the questions that I get a lot is what causes the different colors in Illinois fluorite? Uh, re really, you know, in fluorite in general. Um, so first of all, Illinois fluorite is concentrically zoned. So we know that from looking at that, that last uh, paragenetic sequence, we know that there's multiple colors of, of fluorite that's coming through. And in this slice, this is a, a slice from the Gaskins mine. Um, in this slice, you can see those, those different generations and different colors of fluorite. And each one of those zones represents a different period of time during crystal growth. Okay, so you can almost think of this as, as tree rings in a way of the mineral deposit. Um, now the zoning results from temporal changes uh, within the environment while that crystal is growing. So, um, so that environment, uh, the changes in that environment are, are likely compositional changes in the fluid um, between the different concentric zones uh, that these can be induced uh, by uh, changes in the pH of the fluid, changes in the temperature. Uh, so obviously with each pulse of fluid that's coming through related to tectonic events, there's likely changes in the, the, the composition of that fluid uh, as well as um, uh, temperature, pH, et cetera. Um, color changes in fluoride is often associated with compositional variation of those precipitating fluids. And um, one of the main things that's been uh, thought of as a major color change is trace quantities of rare earth elements that is filling in uh, structural defects within the fluoride. Uh, so you have a fluorine vacancy, then you have, you only need a little bit, uh, parts per billion really to, to change the color uh, of these minerals. Uh, where the rare earth element is filling in this fluorine vacancy due to a defect and you get a color change. There's a ton of work that could be done on this. I would encourage somebody to do a dissertation on this. Um, okay, so that's, I think, enough of the geology and the history. Um, so now we're getting into the fluorite specimens. So um, those of you that, that don't want to look at um, uh, pictures of fluorite, now is the time to sign off, uh, but I know a lot of you are mineral collectors and, and love to see beautiful pictures. These are some of my favorite specimens of fluorite that, have, that are out there. Some of them I've handled before, uh, many of them I haven't. Uh, they came out of Ross's collection and went straight to uh, some of the, the top tiered collectors. Uh, we're going to go through Cave and Rock first. Uh, which is this uh, southern district uh, separated by a major fault in Graben system. Uh, and then we'll get into Harris Creek, uh, most notably the Denton uh, mine and Annabelle Lee mine. Okay, so uh, most of you have seen some of the modern specimens that are coming out of Hasty Quarry. I thought it was pertinent to uh, show this specimen. Now, um, when I put the picture of this specimen in, um, they hadn't found the most recent specimens uh, that popped up last year at uh, the Tucson show, which are just very, very complex stepped fluorites. They're, they're really quite beautiful and kind of blow the specimen out of the water. Uh, but this just gives me an idea of what they're finding. And like I said, this is up in this, what I like to call this oxidation zone. There's often a lot of dissolution that occurs. Uh, many times they're etched out. Um, so they don't typically preserve great specimens like the ones that we're used to from deep down in the, uh, the deeper mines, uh, but you kind of get the point. Okay, so, so moving on to, to some of the older, uh, more famous mines that we all know and love. Uh, first off is Hill Ledford. This is one of my uh, favorite mineral localities. It was operated in the 1950s until 1971. It's located on the west side of Minerva. Um, I would encourage many of you to, uh, to get um, our, our latest and greatest publication, 
Uh, I believe it's circular 604. I think you can buy it from uh, ISGS. It documents all of the mines. It's got a beautiful mine map on it. Uh, there's lots of great information in it. Um, now, notable about Hill Ledford Mine was it was a major breccia pipe that they were that they were mining. So that fourth uh, ore body type that I talked about. Uh, and some of the most notable things that were found at Hill, uh, Hill Ledford was the dark purple fluorites um, that had a very interesting mosaic texture on it and often associated with uh, galena. So here you can see like later stage uh, purple cubes on top of the galena. Uh, this is from the MIM Museum in Beirut. And uh, I have a, I don't know if you can see this, but uh, this is, it's, a lot of people call it black fluorite. Uh, it probably looks black on the, uh, the, the zoom screen, uh, but it does have a, a slight purple tint to it. Uh, but very, very neat fluorites. Uh, next is Crystal Victory Complex. Uh, some modern specimens from the Crystal Victory Complex have uh, came out. I know at one point in time, an addit uh, into Crystal Victory was opened up in Hasty. And uh, at the time, uh, the area that it was opened up was flooded, uh, but during a drought, uh, the, the lake in front of the attic had dried up and people were able to sneak in there and get out some pretty good specimens. Uh, Crystal Victory Complex operated from the 1920s until the 1930s. Uh, so those addits that I showed in, in uh, Hasty Quarry, that's basically what the addits of uh, Crystal Victory Complex look like. Um, numerous shafts, uh, but there was also an incline that went into to the crystal mine, and that that incline is what people were uh, sneaking into from uh, Spar Mountain, where Hasty is is currently uh, mining into. Um, it closed in the early 1970s, and this is just a fantastic specimen that shows uh, that that later new generation growing on that early, largely undissolved uh, yellow generation. <clears throat> West Green Mine, uh, one of the, the lesser known mines. Um, this was owned by Ozark Mahoney and it was active from 1946 to 1949, uh, perhaps later. Now the Green Complex, uh, in talking with Ross, it seems like he's attributing a lot more specimens to the, the Green Mine Complex. And I think, you know, He's been he's been doing a lot of research, and uh, the more older specimens that he runs into, he's been you know uh, changing uh, mine locations, and uh, it's it's really got me scratching my head, and, and makes me wonder if specimens that I have have the the, the right uh, association uh, from the mine. Uh, but as you can see, this is just a gorgeous uh, specimen that shows. The, the zoning that we all love. It's got almost a druzy of calcite overgrowing that. So calcite was one of the later gang mineralizations and it's growing on a bed of uh, barite that looks to be on a early generation of uh, yellow fluorite. Uh, here's a beautifully zoned specimen from the East Green Mine, again in the Green uh, Mine Complex, also owned by Ozark Mahoney. Uh, active in the late 1940s into 1953. I think they went back in. Uh, the, the mineralization there was largely a fracture zone uh, and uh, there was a major solution, solution collapse feature that was documented there that I can only imagine the specimens that, that came from that a solution collapse uh, feature. But, you know, you look at this and, and you might think, I mean, this this looks like a Minerva piece, right? But nope, uh, East Green Mine. Of course, you know, in Cave and Rock, they're all all the mines are are basically developing along the the same major fault. So it's not too far fetched to think, oh, you're going to see the same uh, uh, paragenetic sequence uh, uh, or fluoride generations at all of these mines. Uh, and again, another green mine complex. I think this was one of the specimens that he changed uh, to green mine complex. Uh, again, all of green mine complex at one by Ozark Mahoney operated again, 1940s, 1953. And then they actually went back in in the early 1970s. Um, so the whole complex uh, consists of east, west, and north mines. Uh, so he just calls this one a green mine complex specimen. <clears throat> Again, another green mine complex specimen. Um, so I know that I had some of these specimens and attribute it to the wrong location. So if you have, uh, this is a very notable find. 
uh, of these blue fluorides uh, with uh, the, the calcite uh, scalenohedrons or needles uh, overgrowing these blue fluorides, uh, you might consider writing on your label that this might be green mine complex. Okay, so moving on to the Annabelle Lee, uh, probably my favorite location. This was the last major mine to be operated by Ozark Mahoney. Um, so it again closed in 1995. Uh, it opened up in 1984. Uh, there were numerous uh, narrow pods, less than 100 feet wide, uh, that ran parallel with the major structures uh, that they were following um, in in uh, uh, the subdistrict. Um, this particular specimen, um, or I believe uh, Annabelle Lee was was actually discovered uh, in the mid 1970s, uh, and uh, Bob Perry, uh, who was the general manager, uh, named this mine. And uh, Bob Perry was a local, and he was tired of all of the mine names being named after local families. And uh, which is very common in the district, uh, uh, Oxford, Hicks, um, uh, all you know, local families. Um, so he decided he was going to let people know that miners know something about life. And so he named uh, this uh, mine after his uh, favorite Edgar Allan poem, uh, uh, or sorry, Edgar Allan Poe uh, poem, and named it Annabelle Lee Mine. Um, so that's that's a pretty cool story on how that mine came to be. Um, now, specimens are very similar uh, from Annabelle Lee to Denton, uh, with the exception of blue celestites uh, and uh, barite pseudomorphine after celestites. So celestites were uh, unique to Annabelle Lee. Uh, the north end of this mine produced a number of yellow and amber color fluorides, often uh, referred to as orange fluorides. Uh, Mahoney number seven is also very uh, well known for those, those orange fluorides. The ones at uh, Annabelle Lee were often associated with uh, those spiky calcites. Uh, here's another uh, Annabelle Lee piece. This is uh, circa 1986. Uh, this specimen, as you can see, 22 centimeters, uh, just a, a beautiful uh, large example uh, of the fluorite on uh, beta spalarite. <clears throat> uh, another Annabelle Lee piece, uh, a beautiful piece. You can see a, a bed of uh, barite and uh, the blue fluorite growing over that bed of fluorite, uh, or barite, sorry, and you can see the, uh, the crystals uh, as inclusions uh, within that fluorite, a very neat specimen. And uh, also typical of Annabelle Lee are uh, deeper uh, purple fluorides over an etched out uh, yellow. Uh, in fact, some of the, the specimens, the, the more modern specimens that were being pulled out of the Crystal Victory complex looked a lot like this as well. Um, so there's something important to note. This one came out of the Livingston uh, trend named after Eric Livingston, the senior geologist there. This is a uh, circa 1989 specimen. Okay, so moving to the Denton mine, uh, I'm sure many of you love the Denton mine. Uh, the best thing about the Denton mine, in, in my opinion, is the association uh, with uh, the other minerals. So the, the fluoride association in here, in this case, uh, associated with a very lustrous galena and calcopyrites in there. Uh, this was the first mine to open in Harris Creek subdistrict in 1980, closed in 1994, so right before Annabelle Lee. Uh, the fluorite is commonly zoned uh, with great luster. Uh, the specimen, as you can see, does not have that great luster. Uh, it was attacked by uh, a later acidic fluid. Um, again, the, the, the high quality association with uh, other gang minerals is what's wonderful about Den, but also uh, famous uh, for um, uh, Denton mine is the fantastic orange calcites, and I, I really should have put a picture of one in here. Uh, didn't even think to do that. That was referred to uh, as the Bahama pod. Uh, again, an interesting story uh, that uh, when they, they discovered it, uh, he, the, the, the mine super discovered it, uh, 
used a reference that it was uh, so many miles from the Bahamas. So it got named the Bahamapod. Uh, this particular specimen was collected by Wig Jones. And uh, something notable about, about the Cave and Rock District, or, or really the whole IKFD, is, is the names of locals. There's just some wonderful names of people there. Uh, Wig Jones, I mean, you just can't make that up. Um, here's another just absolute fire specimen uh, of fluorite from the Denton Mine. Uh, this is now housed in the, the MIM Museum uh, in Beirut, Lebanon. Uh, also known for Denton were some of the twins. Now, uh, fluorite penetration twins were found throughout the district, um, but the best location for penetration twins was at Denton Mine. And this specimen is 16 centimeters. Uh, I've handled quite a few twins, but never one that large. It's, that's pretty fantastic. I see a lot of people uh, online, obviously there's so many Instagram experts these days on IKFD, which is great. I love the fact that so many people are interested in it. But one of the most common mistakes that I see is uh, people calling uh, a fluorite uh, uh, cubes that are, are, are intergrowth twins that are not actually penetration twins. This is a good sample of them. This is from uh, circa 1984 to 1985. Uh, and that was from Lilypod, uh, named after Ross Lilly. Uh, also from uh, Denton Mine, this one comes from the Bahamapod. Uh, some of you have maybe seen this. Again, just a wonderful association where you have uh, an early fluorite that is then uh, covered in uh, a thin druse of lustrous galenas, and then another later generation of fluorite uh, overgrowing those galenas. Uh, a fantastic examples, and uh, I believe there was only one significant pocket of, the, of these found. <clears throat> uh, this is a, a pretty cool specimen, um, and I like it because you can actually see the hydrocarbons preserved on an earlier generation of the blue. Um, and now when this specimen was found, it would have been completely coated in the hydrocarbons. Um, not this later growth, just this early growth. And what's cool about this specimen is you can see uh, within the cube, you can see the hydrocarbons uh, that are coating that cube. Um, now, Ross had this specimen and uh, he told me that he wishes he would have left the hydrocarbons on. Obviously it's a risk, you know, sometimes uh, the hydrocarbons preserved, preserve uh, the fluorite uh, from being etched out, uh, but oftentimes there's early, earlier generations of uh, acidic fluids that etch that fluoride out that are then later covered with hydrocarbons. So it's always a gamble. Uh, taking the hydrocarbons off. So the fluorite was not glassy as he had hoped. <laughs> uh, here is a wonderful specimen. Uh, these are pretty rare. Um, I have never actually had one. Uh, I believe this one is in uh, Dr. Jim Gable's uh, collection. Uh, this was mined in August 1993 by J.D. Ketton. Um, and uh, it qua caused quite a stir when they found this pocket. Uh, this, these calcopyrites on the fluorite looked more like something that you might see from viburnum trend. Uh, they showed this rainbow iridescence, uh, which all the miners were talking about, and I'm sure they got a pretty penny for them. Uh, you know, they would sneak out these specimens in their lunchbox, which would pay for that day's, you know, cigarettes and beer at the end of the shift. And I, I'm sure they, they, uh, they, they made some money on these ones. Uh, this is another neat specimen. Uh, in this case, the calcopyrites are actually oxidized, so, so leaving uh, this kind of oxidized uh, coating uh, of iron, uh, maybe limonite staining on the fluorite specimen itself. Uh, but you get secondary uh, minerals forming, uh, likely copper minerals from the oxidation of the calcopyrite uh, and, and perhaps a malachite coating, a partial malachite coating. Uh, on the calcite. Uh, this was found by Ronnie Martin in July 1994 uh, from an old pocket near the shaft. A lot of times when the guys would be walking out, you know, the, at the end of their shift is when they'd be looking for pockets, you know, if they had some space in their lunchbox to fill. So a lot of good specimens came out uh, as the guy was walking to the, the hoist uh, to make sure that he had filled up uh, his lunchbox. 
Uh, another cool specimen. This really shows uh, dissolution textures quite, quite nice, uh, showing this uh, mosaic pattern on the fluorite, um, almost like a parkade look. And you can get that parkade growth uh, also from just uh, fluorite uh, growth and terminations, but you can also get it from dissolution as well. Um, so um, unlike uh, Elmwood, where you often see dissolution occurring from the center of the fluoride out, uh, here uh, in the IKFD, often the dissolution uh, starts in the outside moving in. Another beautiful Denton piece, uh, just, just a really lovely piece showing uh, stepped growth all over the place, uh, beautiful zoning, uh, just a really lovely specimen. Um, and I do have a calcite specimen from Denton. Uh, these are probably my favorite uh, find from Denton. The, the orange calcites are great and iconic, but um, in my personal opinion, this was the best find of calcites. Uh, they called this the bottle cap uh, pocket for obvious reasons. You have uh, a scalenohedron and then a modified ROM capping uh, that calcite, uh, much like the, uh, the uh, calcite scepters from Shoalsburg up in the upper Mississippi Valley. These were found in 1987. Uh, only a dozen or so uh, specimens were found in the pocket. I have two of them in my collection. Uh, I, I know of a couple others in, in other collections. These were uh, collected by Wendell Smith. Uh, beautiful coarse calcopyrite in between uh, those, those calcite uh, nail heads. <clears throat> Uh, a very iconic fluorite here. I know this has been used on posters in the past for mineral shows. Uh, this was found loose in the pocket. That was often the case, uh, as you can imagine, uh, with so many fluids coming up and so much dissolution, you'd often get pocket collapsed. And so the, the matrix, if, there were, if the fluorites were growing on a matrix, often you would get the fluorites dropping out into the pocket. So uh, you often hear people referring to uh, Illinois fluorites as floaters. Uh, most of Illinois flor fluorites are floaters. So um, it's, it's kind of a, a silly term to use when talking about fluorite. Um, this specimen was barely attached um, as a late secondary overgrowth on an earlier fluorite. Um, this is... Uh, Probably, um, at least in Ross's opinion, one of the best uh, uh, specimens from uh, that came out from uh, Denmark, at least for zoning type. Um, okay, moving on to the famous Minerva uh, number one mine, and this is uh, this is where the iconic fluorites uh, come out of, uh, and. In my opinion, these are the icons, the, the, the blue uh, fluorites over uh, a purple core. Um, Minerva Mine, um, it operated from the 1940s until 1995. Uh, it did close down in between that and they let the entire uh, mine flood. Um, and uh, they, they ended up going back in and pumping it out. It took about a year and a half to pump out. In fact, the, the head mine engineer was uh, the guy that I talked to that was there at the Barnett mine, com, uh, mine disaster. And he was in charge of pumping that mine out. And he said it was, it was, mo it was the craziest thing that he had ever done in his life. They used boats to go into the shafts and they had to, as they were pumping it out, they had to slowly pull in the pump. Uh, and as the, uh, the water level would go down, they could get further in with the boats and pull the pump further in and they just kept working their, their way down. Uh, so, so pretty crazy to do over a year and a half of time. Um, besides fluorite at Minerva, it's known for world-class specimens of wertherite, uh, strontianite, bestonite, uh, benstonite. Um, uh, best, benstonite, I should mention, uh, when I was younger and first started collecting Illinois fluorite, uh, all the old school collectors would always ask, oh, do you have a benstonite? And, uh, you know, if you had a Benz tonight, that meant you were a, a true uh, Illinois collector. Uh, at, back in the day, they were just really hard to come by. And uh, now I see them all over the place, uh, which which is great. I love them. Uh, but also Alstonite specimens there, which are much more rare and para-Alstonite. Um, really world-class specimens of para-Alstonite. They're just very, very tiny. <clears throat> okay, uh, this is... 
Um, likely 20 centimeters. Uh, I couldn't get uh, an actual measurement on it from MIM. Uh, that was just an estimate uh, based on Ross's guess. Uh, this is just a beautiful yellow. Yellows are probably the hardest, uh, like as far as quality goes, the hardest uh, specimens to find in the IKFD. Uh, like I said, most of the yellows uh, got etched out, um, as we'll see in the next slide. Uh, they, they make for beautiful zoning, but again, glassy yellows are just hard to come by. Uh, blues are much more common, but certainly more sought after. Uh, this is a very famous specimen. Uh, this comes from the blue cap pocket. Uh, September 1990, it was found. Uh, it was found in the crosscut ore body. And something notable from the specimen or all the specimens that came from this pocket is the thickness of the glassy blue. Um, <clears throat> and, and so just note all of the thickness and that's kind of how you know that the specimen came from the blue cap pocket uh, is the, the thickness of that glassy blue. And again, this is uh, probably the finest uh, pocket that was ever collected in the <clears throat> IKFD, excuse me. Uh, here's another beautiful blue specimen, a lot going on. This is on a bed of barite. Uh, you can see hydrocarbon inclusions in there. Uh, again, with a, a purple core, this came out circa 1992 to 1993. Um, well, I should, I should pull this specimen out of my cabinet because uh, Jeff does great at photography, but sometimes specimens are really hard to capture um, in a photo. But this specimen, I, I kid you not, in person, it is probably the best witherite fluorite uh, combo you've ever seen. It, it's really, really a fantastic specimen, and the, the picture just doesn't uh, uh, give it justice. Maybe I'll, I'll post a, a picture on Instagram, uh, maybe tomorrow or later in the week. Uh, again, uh, this is uh, also from the blue cap pocket. Uh, beautiful blue on the etched out yellow. Uh, you can notice uh, these spherical features uh, in that etched out yellow. These were barite balls uh, that had been dissolved out. People speculate all the time that they're from drips in the mine, but no, it's from barite dissolution. And uh, you know we know that uh, many of the times that barite is preserved. You'll see that in a later specimen. <clears throat> This is just a cool specimen uh, because of the texture. Uh, just look at the, the texture on the specimen, just beautiful mosaics. Uh, in fact, I, I have another specimen. Not, you, you're probably not gonna be able to see the, the mosaic texture, but not only is, is the specimen great because it's a matrix specimen uh, and it's a toadstool, but it also shows just a, a gorgeous mosaic uh, similar to this specimen on screen. Uh, I don't know if you can see that, if I get closer to my face or further away, if it disappears. But... Okay. Um, again, etched out yellow and a later generation of glassy fluorite. Um, uh, one of these generations has uh, anomalous concentration of hydrocarbons that was included. Um, I just love this, it looks very exotic. Again, I think this is uh, in Jim Gable's collection. Uh, but I'm sure it just lights up uh, in fluorescent light. Uh, this was found in the Northwest Cross uh, cut ore body in 1992. Uh, this is a specimen that I handled years ago. Um, I don't believe it came from the blue cap pocket, but what was notable about this specimen was the thickness of the blue. Uh, again, this, this specimen is just unbelievable in person. Uh, it's now in a private collection and uh, very, very glassy, also hydrocarbon inclusions on a bed of spallery. I mean, what do I need to say about this specimen? I mean, the, the picture says it all. Um, it, it makes me want to hop on a plane and, and go to uh, uh, Lebanon tomorrow and, and just stare at the specimen. I mean, it, it is just on fire, it's unbelievable. Uh, this is a cool specimen, kind of looks like a heart, uh, if you like. Uh, uh, mineral shapes, <laughs> um, uh, just a, a beautiful stepped uh, fluorite with, uh, again, that kind of parkade uh, growth, many, many uh, terminations on this uh, specimen. 
Uh, again, the oranges, uh, the oranges were most commonly found in Mahone, Mahoning 7, but uh, Minerva, and as I noted before, Denton also had some oranges. Uh, oranges are rather hard to come by, at least that are uh, largely focused as, as, as an orange specimen, uh, but later, you know, usually have a, a, a thinner uh, blue generation overgrowing of them, as you can see here. Uh, typically, the oranges are very glassy, though. Uh, again, a neat specimen that shows uh, the interaction uh, with hydrocarbons. This one, you can just see it really, really well. You can see the zoning of hydrocarbons and hydrocarbon bubbles inside this specimen. Uh, I have numerous specimens that uh, have moving uh, uh, bubbles of uh, fluids within uh, two-phase uh, hydrocarbon fluid inclusions. Uh, this was mined in 1992 to 1993 from the Northwest Prescott ore body. Um, so there's the barite. Um, so this one, uh, I like this specimen because it's not a typical barite. A lot of times uh, the barite balls in the district are very, very chalky. Uh, this one looks more like um, uh, uh, Elmwood barite um, in the sense that it has uh, coarser crystals of barite. Um, so it's a, it's a very neat specimen, but again, the barite often gets dissolved out and will leave those, those uh, spherical features within the fluorite. Um, and uh, again, I mean, there's just no words uh, for this specimen. It's, it's beautiful. Uh, it's a penetration twin. Um, now, uh, I asked Ross about this specimen. He had never seen this specimen in person, so this was not in his collection. Um, I'm sure uh, Danny Trinchio could answer because uh, this is his photographer, um, but I have no idea on the size. I want to just imagine this as a specimen like this, but it, it's just absolutely wonderful. Uh, I would guess it's probably in the, the MIM Museum. Uh, this was a specimen used to advertise this talk. Uh, I handled this specimen five or six years ago. Um, again, this is these are the icons. I mean, this this says it all about the district, in my opinion. Um, these are the iconic fluorides uh, that that we all want to have in our collection, uh, with the the purple growing over uh, or the the blue growing over the purple core. Um, and this is uh, on a bed of barite that wasn't captured in the photo, but if you turn it to the side, it just shows beautiful association with a, a white crystallized barite bed. Um, and lastly, I know I've gone way over time. So those of you that have uh, 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 muscled through this talk, I'll, I'll end on arguably the, the world's best uh, fluorite specimen to come out of the IKFD. Uh, this was on display, I think right after Ross sold his collection, this was on display at the, the Tucson Mineral Show in its own separate case. Um, so those of us that got to see it, um, it is just as, if not more spectacular in person. And you can see again, the hydrocarbons, this specimen was completely coated in hydrocarbons uh, when it was discovered. So sometimes when you take those hydrocarbons off, you are pleasantly surprised with a, a glassy fluorite. Um, this was mined by Eugene Turner. It went to a uh, local mineral dealer, Wink Oxford. And um, so Ross acquired this specimen from Wink and there was often a race uh, from mineral dealers to get down to the district uh, when major specimens were found. Ross uh, uh, beat out other uh, dealers. And Ross said when he uh, drove up on, on Wink, he saw Wink working on these specimens with a wire brush and taking off the, uh, the, the hydrocarbons with a wire brush. And so you can only imagine the other specimens that were uh, destroyed from that wire brush, as we all know that fluoride is a rather soft mineral and the steel wire brush is just gonna completely destroy them. Um, so this is from that famous blue cap pocket in 1990. Um, and I keep talking about hydrocarbons. They, they're really, really important uh, to the preservation uh, of great fluoride specimens and uh, the parogenesis that we see today. Um, so on that, uh, thank you for all of those who, who hung out, and uh, I will uh, try to, to take some questions.